Now, everybody's heard of quantum mechanics or quantum theory or quantum physics. But what I want to do today is take a few minutes to try to talk about the core ideas of this theory, what sets it apart from regular physics, and what makes it so weird. Now, in our everyday experience growing up, we deal with baseballs and footballs and automobiles and airplanes and houses, very, very large objects. Even the smallest object that you've ever had has held trillions of trillions and trillions of these things that we call atoms. So our everyday experience with how these objects behave is basically how they behave when there's trillions of them next to each other. But when you zoom in at the microscopic level, at the quantum level, then what you have is a situation where the behavior begins to differ from what we see in everyday situations to how individual atoms and individual electrons behave, and that's quantum mechanics. Now, probably the number one thing that sets quantum mechanics apart is that every piece of matter, whether it's an atom or an electron or a neutron, and also every piece of light, like a photon, a quantum of light, something like this, they all have what's called wave-particle duality. They have aspects of a wave-like nature and aspects of a particle-like nature at the same time. Now, in the early days, people knew that light had a wave-like nature because what they would do is they would take the light, they would run it through a prism, and then they would split it into the rainbow, and they would take the colors and they would smash them into each other, and they could see that the crest and the troughs would line up and either cancel or reinforce each other, producing these interference patterns. And so we know that interference patterns come along with the nature of light. So we know from a long time ago that light has a wave-like character. And at the same time, we started doing chemistry experiments and figured out that everything is made of atoms, which looked very particle-like because we could do experiments where we could throw these electrons or protons at various targets and we could see their particle nature. But then something weird happened. We started doing experiments with light where we could see that light only comes in discrete chunks, quantized chunks of energy like a particle. And we could also do experiments with electrons and other bits of matter showing that they can interfere in ways that we thought that only uh, applies to light. So we could see the wave-like nature of matter and we could also see the particle-like nature of light. And then once the full quantum theory was born to explain all of this, we realized that all of these phenomena are governed by probabilities, which is the biggest departure from everyday experience. In the quantum realm, everything is governed by probabilities. Let's take a moment and just consider how absolutely incredible Saturn's ring system really is and how lucky we are to have such an amazing celestial object in the sky. Now, most people don't know this, but Saturn's rings, they're one of the flattest objects in the entire solar system, meaning their width is something like 280 thousand kilometers edge to edge like this, right? But their thickness is only about 10 meters. Just think about that for a second. If you were standing there and looking edge on, the thickness of that ring system right there would only be about 10 meters. Now this is an artist's conception of the ring system if you were at the edge looking directly through the ring system towards the planet. Now these rings actually comprised of billions of particles. Many of them are the size of houses or large boulders, but surprisingly most of them, the vast majority, are tiny, tiny little specks of rocks and dust and actually mostly ice that are the size of a single grain of sand. Think about that. Most of it is tiny, tiny dust particles the size of a grain of sand, while some of them are as big as an entire house. Now, Saturn's ring system is truly mind-blowing. As you zoom in, you see more and more and more of these fine gaps and divisions. In fact, if you look inside of this gap, you'll actually see a moon orbiting and kind of clearing a path inside of the ring system. These are called shepherd moons, and as we sent probes to Saturn, we see so many of them, they're all over the place, and they're clearing lanes of traffic inside of the ring system. This is a false color image to show the contrast here. You can see, as you zoom in, you just see so many thousands and thousands of divisions inside the ring system. The largest division is called the Cassini division, but there are millions more as you zoom in. 
Now, the interesting thing about these rings is they're pretty young. They think that they actually were formed by the breakup of some sort of comet, maybe even only 10 million years ago, which sounds like a long time, but is really short time in geologic time. So very young, and actually these rings are going to disappear as on the inner edge, they're slowly attracted into the atmosphere of Saturn, falling down as sort of like ring rain, dusty rain like that. And so they could be gone in only 100 million years. Now, I recently went down a rabbit hole on something called spontaneous human combustion. And I wanted to talk about, is that a real phenomenon or is it something just totally misunderstood and not real at all? Now, the most famous case of this, the one everybody points to when you talk about spontaneous combustion, is an unfortunate woman named Mary Reeser. In 1951, she was found burned, completely burned, nothing left over, sitting in a recliner. So she was totally combusted. Part of the chair was burned. Nothing else in the room was actually on fire or even scorched. And so the question is, can the human body under certain circumstances and certain conditions, can it generate enough internal body heat to actually spontaneously combust without an external ignition source? The short answer is no, it's not possible. In fact, when you look at these cases, and I've looked at several of them in detail, when you get past the headlines, when you really look at them in any great detail, you'll find that most of the cases, they were usually smoking or had some other ignition source nearby. It wasn't totally clear what was really going on, but it's plausible that a lot of people fall asleep smoking cigarettes, and that is actually the cause of most of these cases. But there's a little more to it if you stick with with me. Now, the human body does generate its own internal heat. Uh, when you get a fever, for instance, your body temperature gets elevated. Our whole body is geared to regulate internal temperatures. And how is that heat generated? Well, there are chemical reactions inside the cell that release energy, exothermic reactions. Energy is what causes our body temperature to be maintained. Now, to actually catch a human body on fire, it would need to reach activation energy or kindling energy, something like 500 degrees Fahrenheit, would be what that would be needed, but our typical body temperature is held at around 98.6 degrees. So the chemistry in our body is just not possible to go from maintaining that typical body temperature about 100 degrees Fahrenheit five times higher in order to self-ignite. But the bigger problem is that our bodies are around 70 or 80 percent water, and water is an incredible heat sink. It can absorb a lot of energy and then phase change away, taking the heat away. It's difficult to burn wet things. Now, in many of these cases, they think what happened is called the wick effect. There's a lot of fat in the body, and when that fat gets melted, it can kind of wick through the clothing and slowly burn over time. One of the top questions that I constantly get emailed is, did we fake the moon landings? The answer is no, we did not fake the moon landings. I wanna talk about why. Let's just get this out of the way to begin with. Uh, India and other countries have sent independent space probes to orbit the moon and returned images of the Apollo landing site. This is the Apollo 11 landing site with its shadow, and this is the Apollo 12 landing site with its long shadow. We absolutely did land on the moon, and not just once, but many times. When people email me and say, hey, uh, did we really go to the moon? They mention all these pictures and all of the complete blackness of the sky and said, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we see stars in the sky? Well, listen, uh, go outside uh, during the daytime when the sun is high in the sky with your eyes. Do you see stars in the sky during the day? Well, the answer is no. The reason you don't see stars is because the sun is so bright in the sky that your eyes does, do not have the dynamic range to see the brightness of the sun and the very faint uh, stars in the sky. Remember, stars are always out even during the daytime. Here's another image where you can clearly see no stars visible. Go take a camera, a regular camera outside, and set it for a normal exposure uh, to illuminate the foreground, and you will not see any stars in the sky with any consumer grade camera that you will just point and shoot with a short exposure. What's going on here is the lander is so bright with the sun, which is directly out in the sky during these pictures, that it washes out and makes it impossible for the sensor to at the same time image the stars in the sky along with the very, very bright surface and the lander that's in the foreground. 
the images on the moon look a little bit otherworldly because we don't have direct experience with those conditions. On the Earth, we have the sun in the sky, but we have light reflecting off of buildings, light reflecting off of trees, light reflecting off of the clouds even in the sky. And so anytime you see a car or something in the Earth or on the Earth, it's illuminated from multiple directions. But on the surface of the moon, really you have a single point source and some minor reflections off of the surface of the moon. So really it's like a point source illuminating and so it makes the shadows look a little bit different than you might expect. You know, we sent little rovers to the moon with astronauts driving around several times and you can see dust being kicked up on the lunar surface. When you analyze the trajectory of that dust in the video footage, it's moving in a parabolic arc without any air, impossible to fake. If we were faking it, the Russians who were tracking the spacecraft would have said so. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about just how ridiculously fast the speed of light really is. Now we know that light itself is an oscillating magnetic field and an oscillating electric field propagating through space with no medium. It comes in chunks or packets of energy called photons. And the speed of light is always the same number no matter how fast you are moving or no matter how fast the source of the light is moving. In numbers, the speed of light is about 186,000 miles per second. That's a second, that's a second, that's a second. I'm even going a little too fast. 186,000, 186,000, and so on. That's about seven times all the way around the planet Earth every single second. In terms of meters, that's about 300 million meters every single second, which is about 300,000 kilometers per second. And that means that a photon can travel from the Earth all the way to the moon in about 1.3 seconds. Now the Earth is about 93 million miles away from the sun, but even at that distance, it takes light about eight minutes to travel from the sun to the Earth. And that means that if the sun somehow just disappeared right now, we wouldn't even know about it for about eight minutes. Now think about how fast light is, seven times around the Earth in one second, but yet it still takes light about eight minutes to get to the sun. That tells you two things. Light is really ridiculously fast, and the universe and everything in it is ridiculously spaced out far apart. At the other end of the solar system, we have Neptune here, which is about four and a half billion kilometers away, and it takes light about four hours to travel all the way out to Neptune. Here's another picture with the sun at the center. The heliopause is the boundary of the solar wind, and it would take light about 17 hours to reach the edge. But that's not where the solar system stops. After that, we have the Kuiper Belt and then the Oort Cloud. It would take light about two years to reach the edge of the Oort Cloud. Here's a cartoon of the Milky Way with two satellite galaxies that we have. The Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. It would take light about 100,000 years to cross our galaxy. The Milky Way is a couple of satellite galaxies that you can see right here, which are about 200,000 light years away and the Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years away. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.